our second to last Posty of the quarter. So we host a session every week because we believe in the freedom of ideas and the open exchange of information. And whether or not you agree with everything you hear, hear today or read the books on our shelves or the articles in our databases, we want everyone to have access to those ideas and that information so that you can make them own So I'm going to ask that everyone be respectful and turn off your cell phones if you have them. Put them on vibrate at the very least if you're expecting an important call. But at the end of this, I'm going to ask you to fill out a short survey about what you liked about the session, what we can improve. We'd like for these to remain relevant and interesting for you all. Next week, we'll be hosting our last COSI with Craig Schwartz, who's a history faculty here, and he'll be discussing ISIS. ISIL is the Islamic State a consequence of U.S. foreign policy. But today, please join me in welcoming Kathleen Alkaya, if I pronounce it. Oh, Alkala. Alkala. Mm -hmm. Paul Hunter and Debbie Harada from Arabian Chronicles. They will share their work in a discussion titled Still in Light, publishing and editing a Seattle-based multicultural magazine since 1991. So please, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kathleen, Debbie, and Paul.
Thank you, Phoebe. I had a great time. Nearly finished reading the new issue. Great stuff. Your ethical spirit embodies the entire magazine. Almost feeling the urge to get a crow tattoo. <laughs> Though mine would likely look more like Tony Millionaire's Drinky Crow. A great local lit and others watering hole. All the best. Larry Chris. Um, we don't pay much, but publishing in Raven makes our readers and contributors very happy. They often keep their checks instead of cashing them. <laughs> the Raven Chronicles is a reflection, a refraction, if you will, of our place in the world. It gives us a chance to talk back instead of being labeled and projected onto. Close to 1,500 writers have published in Raven over these 24 years and over 300 artists. If they were not well known when we published them, many of them are now. While we started out local, contributors now live all over the United States and at least 10 other countries. Writers continue to seek us out as the right venue for their work. We try to be careful and respectful, understanding that writing comes from a deep personal place and can be the first work a writer has shared in public. In the meantime, Phil published a book, Phoebe raised several cats with her partner and our invaluable graphic artist, Scott Martin, and Phoebe recently survived cancer without missing an issue. I raised the sun and published five books. A chronicle is an accounting of how time has passed, chronos, and I cannot think of a better way to have spent my time than helping to bring so many stories, poems, songs, and images to a wider audience. It will live on in several forms long after we are gone. As the magazine continues to evolve, we are exploring audio tracks of some of our stories and interviews and other ways in which we can continue to learn from Raven. Raven is in this for the long haul. We expect our contributors to be read long into the future. I'm preparing to teach a class on the apocalyptic novel next fall. <laughs> and the worst thing that many writers can imagine is a world without books or freedom of opinion. By creating the Raven Chronicles as a diverse, free-range, multi-viewed and multimedia endeavor, we're doing our best to make sure that doesn't happen. At least, not without a fight. <laughs> and now, Paul Hunter. Good faith, 
and rewards or failures and punishments on both sides. And there are other questions, such as where is an audience to be found? And how do you know when you've caught one? Because you do have to fish for an audience. Dangle a seduction with a sharp point hidden in it. Trust me. Brownigan, in Trout Fishing in America at the beginning, has that little note that says, there are seductions that should be hanging in the Smithsonian alongside the spirit of St. Louis. <laughs> here we, but here we are about one peculiar form of publication, the magazine. And what is the job of a magazine? To render a snapshot of the emotional and mental life of the times, which is a moving target that you may have to lead in order to connect. Take it from this old bird hunter. There are two methods. You triangulate, and there's the paintbrush method. You figure out where the moving target's going to be, and pick that point and you shoot at it. Or you, you, take, your, you take your gun like a paintbrush, and you swing it through the moving target, pull the trigger, and keep your gun moving, and you will usually get the target. Useful information. Okay, sometimes suppositions and responses seem stuck in place for decades, and sometimes they shift week by week. This is the nature of magazines. Reading a magazine that has been around for a while, you may get to see changes and developments. One preoccupation exchanged for another. Uh, one style dropped, abandoned gradually or suddenly. This is the nature of the beast that is literature in the moment, reflecting who we are, what we're conscious of, and where we'd like to be. On that note, a bit more might be said by way of history about magazines and newspapers. I didn't think you were going to stumble into that, but here we are. Both came out of what we now call a scene. The first newspapers, called Courants, appeared in the Netherlands in the early 1600s in Amsterdam cafes and coffee houses. Then the papers of Addison and Steele, the first magazines, appeared a century later in the early 1700s in London. The Tatler and the Spectator, the Rambler and the Idler, and their dozens of imitators appeared, <coughs> sprung up like weeds. The Tatler first appearing three times a week, then the Spectator daily five times a week. Often they burn themselves out with their breakneck pace, usually lasting only a couple of years. How can a writer survive without a vacation? These magazines arrived to feed a new leisure scene, to educate a rising middle class who suddenly had more money and time than taste. This is, by the way, this is still true. <laughs> As grown-ups, no longer in school, they needed to know which were the important thoughts and manners, which fork to use, how to dress. You notice a there's a complicated, there's a subtext here that I'm never, I'm never going to say a word about. It. <laughs> At first, it was mostly satiric. Isaac Bickerstaff, that fictional character, offered the reader a mocking but real education, ways to laugh at themselves and each other, ways to avoid the most egregious errors. The classroom for all this adult education was the coffee house. There were 600 coffee houses in London in the first decade of the 18th century. And then, as now, people were usually were easily hooked on caffeine and gab. <laughs> they go together. And the coffee houses were the backbone of this new form of entertainment. That its first and most lasting subscribers. These magazines were read to tatters, and people came to the coffee houses to read them for free. And the role of magazines then as now was to provide furniture for the mind, of, to furnish it with subjects for thought and contemplation, to let the rising middle class ape their betters, <laughs> as the upper crust put it then, and in private still does. <laughs> ape their betters. 
But now let us turn to Raven Chronicles, which in some ways has had a unique impulse and trajectory. And I'm saying this from outside of the grid. A pioneer from the first of the magazine's ambition was to be a multicultural magazine. Not a forum for debate so much as an exchange. Open, respectful, ready for anything. But what did it, does it mean to be multicultural? And how is a multicultural magazine achieved or recognized? For that matter, for that matter why bother? I had never seen one. Neither had most of the Raven Chronicles writers and editors early on. It was a dream of how the world might be, not how it was. This penguin walks into a bar. <laughs> Goes up to the bartender and says, has my dad been in here today? Bartender says, I don't know, what's it look like? <laughs> so, see, multicultural means, never mind. So, grant that it took courage and leadership for a little group to hang out its shingle and see if any business developed. The only thing like it that I had experienced was the underground newspapers of the 60s and 70s here in Seattle. The Helix, the Flag, and the Sun, and I wrote for all of them. But these weekly magazines were multicultural only to the extent that the whole youth movement thought it was multicultural. And though there were a lot of experiments going along, a lot of beads and feathers and fringes, <laughs> it mostly wasn't multicultural. There were a lot of groups with the identity and self-respect. There weren't a lot of groups with the identity and self-respect it took to ask other groups to view them as they viewed themselves. There weren't a lot of groups, period. Though in the 70s they formed and reformed endlessly. As Robert Bly said in 1969, the world will soon be breaking up into small colonies of the saved. <laughs> but the Raven Chronicles was different and was predicated on social maturity. Perhaps, perhaps not consciously, but the keys were mutual respect and a growing curiosity. I was frankly surprised at how the magazine ballooned over its first couple of years. Ballooned as it spread its sails and caught the prevailing winds. There were more cultural cultures out there with voices, songs, and stories than I had imagined. I was humbled, but more than that, I was engaged. These writers weren't just talking to narrow cliques, they were talking beyond family and regional experience, and they were talking to each other, and they were talking to me. For the historian looking back, say wanting to examine an engrossing cultural moment like the O.J. Simpson trial in 1994, the Clinton impeachment in 1998, or the loss of lives and sense of safety and surety in 9-11, or the economic debacle of 2008, if you read Raven Chronicles closely around those times, you'll find small indirect hints in the poems and stories and articles published there, but you won't find any direct references. Because where, when a magazine is a mirror at all, it's a funhouse mirror full of misdirections, distortions, disguises. It tries to show not one dark, narrow path, but a wider ming mingling of interests and values, a myriad of lights. Magazines have to make do with the forces that feed them. Cravings and competitions and chance. 
They have to balance the familiar with the new in re rendering that snapshot in motion. Raven Chronicles has for a good while not waited passively till the next big noisy movements and talents came along, but have engaged their audience by, as Kathleen mentioned, offering themes, questions, topics, what ifs. And why not? Editing a magazine is a form of play. Most successful as all play is when there is an intensity and seriousness about some matter, matters that are otherwise beneath us. A willingness to invent and play the game. To trust a leavening of laughter in our quest for fun. Since we are, after all, children in a land of endless variety, of endless contradictions and failings, of endless consequences we are mired in, yet struggle to get beyond, attempt to, to transcend with our outrageous make-believe. knee-deep in seaweed. She slid with each step, stuck in racks so fresh, isopods still twitched on the slippery surface. Not even the sand fleas had climbed it yet. Amazed, she knelt, gathered armfuls from mounds so bright, the seaweed glittered flashes of brown, red, and green, festoons of taffeta, fit a salmon queen. Ribbon and eyelet, ravel and frill, caught in wonder. She selected sea lace and sea laurel, draped red laver and fringe, wound black tassel and blister rack, smooth color changer and confetti, hung whip and bladder, picked sea rose and took red wing. Robed in Sargasso silks, she turned seaward, saw the silver break the sea surface. The salmon came running, groom for the bride, caught in the rack, a wet by the shreds, dressed in the gown, rattled for eons on the hoop of the sea and the moon. by J.T. Stewart. And J.T. Stewart is mentoring me in writing. 
And she said, I want you to ask them, how many of you know what a phone booth is? <laughs> because today, phone booths are very, they used to be where you would open them and go inside and some other, you just walk up to a phone if you can even find one. The other thing she said, remember the Statue of Liberty. And I'll just go from here. The New Colossus by J.T. Stewart. I came to the city and slept in phone booths when it rained. Ed Elmo, Native American poet. Respect this phone booth here on Broadway. Forget AT&T, MCI, Sprint, all their glossy seductions. Regard this phone booth, opening its glass bifold door to the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of our TV streets. Tonight, a man who still speaks blue shoot seat, braids and all, beds down here. What he dreams of, no one knows. Tonight, as the millennium comes, he will call it a glass poem that only ravens understand. The next one is Wales by James Bertolino. And Kathleen said, you know, I could say why I picked on Wales, my, so my husband is Buddhist. You'll see by I. Wales by James Bertolino. In the mountain's white expanse, beyond the tree line, we learned Buddhist holy men come back as humpback whales. The greater their mastery, the further back in time. <laughs> The next poem is For the Lummy Girl Who Found Her Magic in Horses by Tiffany Midge. Every other word she spoke was horse this, horse that, with an otherworldly grin conjuring long, salty afternoons, pony riding beneath the falling sun. She could have been a silhouette traveling along the crimson body of Arizona rock or circling the spiny backbones of desert cliffs she only visited in picture books. If she told me her horse had wings and could take her on nightly flights to the shimmering stars straight to the moon, I would have believed her. If she told me her horse was a blazing ribbon of flame galloping across the Pacific Ocean like a Jesus pony trotting on the water, running forever to save us, I would have believed her. I could see she found her magic in horses. I could see each time the word horse escaped from her throat, an eruption of stretched sinew and bones of an animal too holy to appear in daylight reached out to capture a fringe of this world's curtain. She attempted to keep their tossing heads in the corral of her heart. Their unrestrained tricks secured beneath the fence of her ribcage. Only they continued to fly out like the laughing wild spirit they were. Horse spirit and horse magic ignited by the dreaming of a lummy girl who sang their names in the shadow of sundown who offered them the sweets of her voice in ragged meadows, who called them her own in the pale blue mornings across the land she calls home. One by one, they leapt into the classroom air, and she pulled hard on their reins, led them back in to her heart. Okay.
checked. So we have all of these wonderful writers and a voiceover actor. And so do you all have any questions or comments or anything about editing or publishing, writing? Uh, how about this? Are there uh, internationally, as far as any know, uh, not imitators, but people who, who are publishing similar uh, magazines these days? It sounds like a show with a very unique mission. That's right. I would think of uh, Many Mountains Moving. I don't know yes. if it's still in publication now yeah, sure. in yeah. Boulder. In the 90s, it was kind of one of those amazing that started with the same kind of theme. Yeah. Is there an iconic voice like this? You mean like a person? I mean like, like an Allen Ginsberg or something? Or not just a person. A Robert Lye. Yeah, not just a personage, but a venue. Uh, Everybody's experimenting with self-publishing and 
and everybody can post something on YouTube. So I think we're going through through this excitement of this. And uh, um, I'm a Latina writer, so I hear a lot from other Latina and Latino writers and Native American writers and science fiction writers because I'm interested in science fiction. So we have all of these little groups out there, but what we lack right now is um, editing. There are no real editors right now. When nobody's having their work edited, there are no editors. Mm -hmm. But I think that or proofread. Or, or proofread. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We will we will That's come back to a me. point where there will be trusted agents in the same way that the New York Times is a trusted agent for delivering your news to you, right? We still more or less respect the New York Times. Um, and there are these few and I think that it will filter back out to this notion of there will be trusted agents for people who are in particular interested in seeing work in a multicultural context, um, as opposed to Native Americans only publishing with Native Americans, or blogging to um, a particular group of people, you know, this sort of preaching to the converted notion that we turn to right now, where we don't want to deal with other people's opinions and ideas. Um, but I, I think that once we get over all the excitement of being able to self-publish, that we will sort of migrate back to this notion of why do we want to read certain work? Where do we want our own work to appear in what context? And what sort of people would we like to be in dialogue with as writers and readers? So I, I think we're in, in that loose space in between two. Do you think that maybe a university department of multicultural studies could uh, publish a journal which attracted enough weight to uh, do what you're talking about. I would argue against that. <laughs> <laughs> because of the lens of yeah. the academic world. Yes, because yeah. they have yeah. so many yeah. people yeah. to answer to mm -hmm. um, yeah. that we don't. I, that's been yeah. part of our freedom, is, is yeah. not having the security of, of a university. Mm -hmm. um, also means we don't have the restrictions of a university. Mm -hmm. Wonder, wonder funding. Yeah, we're free of the restrictions and the funding. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the good and the bad. Yeah. About about editing, I can say one thing. I, I was sort of trained in the old school. You know, a lot of my professors um, at Seattle University, where I was in the humanities honors program, it was the Western canon. We read the Western canon. Kaboom! No, sorry. So, um, but anyway, uh, and so I read everything from, you know, the, the pre-Socratic philosophers to Thomas Aquinas, you know, all the way through, and then history up through World War II and beyond, and, uh, you know, it was, it was really very interesting. And, and I always tell people that my first, they ask, oh, what was your most exciting time in graduate school, your most challenging course in graduate school? I said it was my first two years as a freshman and sophomore humanities honors program at Seattle U. Mm -hmm. And that program is still going. I, I'm not sure if it's the same, you know, if it's configured the same now. Well then when I went to graduate school, uh, first at the University of Washington and then in Syrac to Syracuse, um, uh, a lot of my professors were sort of the, you know, the, the, the older, sort of kinder, very relaxed gentlemen of the old school, who were very relaxed and kind because they didn't have a whole lot of competition coming up from you know, uppity women and, you know, fractious persons of, of other ethnic persuasions. You know, it got a little more contentious later, I guess, <clears throat> because by the time I finished uh, my doctorate, you know, I was, I had a really good grounding in everything from grammar and composition, because that's what I knew I was going to have to teach starting out. I taught a lot of what I call fresh person decomposition. So <laughs> I learned grammatical structure. I learned all of that. And what I hadn't known before, I made, I made it my business to know. So, I, you know, I want to tear my hair out. No, I don't. I want to leave my hair in. Uh, for, uh, you know, when I see the possessive form of it in the New York Times spelled I-T apostrophe S. And, you know, as a journalist, it's very important to write correctly you know, dangling modifiers, you know. <laughs> when dangling, don't use modifiers. Right? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, right, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah where are they? Where are the others? And that's so, what it Well, is. what's happened is that is that the super billionaires have laid off everybody. Because yeah. one of the ways they get their billions is to have very few people doing the work. You know, and the, those who are left are exhausted and can only do so much. You know. So my father taught at Seattle University for 50 years. Maybe 55. Wow. 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 He actually yeah. stopped mid corner mid class mid sense. Wow. wow. Just anyway. Wow. And well, the president so I I But anyway, um, I would call him up and I would say, what about this sentence? What about the grammar or whatever? He says any sentence that you have to talk about for more than than eighty seconds or fifty seconds, <laughs> rewrite the damn thing. <laughs> but he also said you have to realize that over time grammar and punctuation and usage follows use. Yeah, so now I'm going to go back to the fifth grade class at, at Hawthorne Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> their language and the telephone booth, their references and their language are going to come through this culture. Right. And it's just not Hawthorne in Columbia right. City. Right. It is North Seattle with A2, um, A26 Seattle, that tutoring center. Yeah. But there's, and I, and I bet here, as a vanguard at Seattle Central, you are already experiencing this. Mm -hmm. right. the, the, the culture that is diverse only in that it is inclusive and it's sort of self-conscious about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who is your father? Ed yeah. Spires. He was in the English department? He sure was. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Ed yeah. wrote that first poem that she wrote out the seminar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about, I'm going to jump in and then I'll let you speak. Oh, sure. I was thinking about, no one has ever asked me about my experiences in graduate school. <laughs> but my high point. But I studied with Charles Johnson, yeah. Colleen yeah. Kilroy, yeah. yeah. Joanna Russ, who's a very famous yeah. science fiction yeah. writer. This is why, you know, I, we came from the middle of nowhere, Colorado, and, yeah. and I jumped into this program. And it was multicultural at the time. And it was a given, you know, that, that this was possible and that we would publish and, and that all of, all of these people would provide feedback and input into what we were doing. So um, I would say that is not the case with the University of Washington uh, graduate no, program right. today. No, right. Yeah, no, it has sort of been split out into people teaching very academic subjects who do, who do fulfill this notion of people of color teaching in the English department, but creative writing in the English department has really narrowed down to, I have to say, exclude <laughs> women and people of color. And those mm -hmm. programs, I mean, the people who are looking for that have gone, up, gone into other departments like ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. So if you are a Latino writer today, you don't go into the English department, you go into ethnic studies at the mm -hmm. UW, which yes. I think is a real tragedy. Yeah, well, there are some things. Yeah, there's some. There's some people, creative writers, teaching in those areas. Right. Like Elisa Moshida. She yes. teaches, yeah. Yeah, but she does right. it, I think, through it. Yes. So, I think yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so yes, it's not through the English because that's we're not English, you know. <laughs> Tell us about Seattle Central and their creative writing or their students or the mass that is somebody. <laughs> yeah, we're from the English department. <laughs> <laughs> the, the group that is going to leave here mm -hmm. and enter the, 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 their culture. I didn't even want to say larger culture because they're Can you give your names? Also? Oh, I'm yeah. Susan Casey. This is Minnie. Minnie Collins. Oh, Minnie Collins. Oh, Minnie Collins. Cyril Miller is a good one. Uh -huh. Yes. yes. So um, I was going to ask a writer's question, but in, in terms of your question, we have a very diverse community in, in terms of those creative writing classes as well as the composition classes. And we're always finding these, you know, these writer's voices popping up from you know, the young Ethiopian immigrant story, here it comes, and, it, and all its heartfelt pain and angst and glory. Um, so they're, they're cropping up everywhere. And I think about the talk we had a couple weeks ago in this series, the African American young man oh, yes. who's talking about being African American and queer mm -hmm. and like choosing to present as a male queer mm -hmm. African American and all those different uh, facets of identity mm -hmm. and what, what he had to say from his story, but then how it could be different from any other African American gay perspective. So mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm starting to see here, which is beautiful. It's just great. But um, my, my question was, 
thinking about um, being a longtime poet and switching into fiction. And I'm just wondering if you guys have also been genre hoppers and if you've had success with that, if it's painful as it is for me, or like I'm having some growing pains. I just thought you might have some experience to share. Well, you've done playwriting. Sure. I've done, and, I'm, and I've got a collection of short stories. Yeah. There's no, no you know, that's, that's something you take on yourself. <laughs> you have to, you, you know, this is, the, this is the word, this is the word of the, the old teacher is that you, um, you don't want to be too quick to judge what the, the impulse is when it comes out. When it first comes out, you, you just chase along after it and scribble as fast as you can and you get it down, get it. And then later you decide whether it's a poem or a story or a song or a something else, a script. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you learn you learn from your mistakes. You, you learn you learn from the year you spent trying to turn this little group of stories into a, a novel, and they're not a novel. They're a group of stories. You learn, that's you learn from your mistakes. I had a I had a t I had a I taught at the University of Washington for four years when I first got to Seattle in the late 60s. I had an assignment once where I asked, asked the students as a kind of end of the term culminating thing, I said, I want you to pick one problem in your culture, in, your, in, in the world around you, and I want you to solve it. <laughs> on paper, on paper, this is just an essay, it's an in-class write. This one girl wrote a piece, um, and she, it was called The Gray People. And one of the things that I had talked about was that, how do you feel about people, the intermarrying of people of different cultures, ethnicities. And her, her perception of that, she, she was, she was from some place whiter than this, you know, than the corner, this corner of the Northwest. And her perception was that people would all eventually, this racial problem would be solved because we'd all turn gray. Wow. We'd all be the color of some kind of cardboard in her mind. Okay. And this cardboard, and of course it's a sad failing of the imagination to figure out that, that it's much richer and more yeah. wonderful than that, and it's it's much more complicated. And you know, my my metaphor for multiculturalism is the movement called Playing for Change, which you can type on playingforchange.com. If you haven't bought any of the CDs, if you haven't heard and seen what they do, it's worldwide. In the United States, it's all street musicians. But in other places in the world, it's the best musicians that the culture has to offer. Mm -hmm. and, and they'll start singing one song, and the song will be sung in different languages. Mm -hmm. They're all to the same kind of, same rhythm, and the, the song may go on for 10 minutes. You can imagine that reggae is sometimes some of the best. And it appeared when a, when a filmmaker mm -hmm. saw a guy playing playing on, on the pier in Santa Monica. And he was playing, he was singing a song, um, everybody needs somebody. Anyway, and then they, they just go around the world. And everybody's got a headphones to hear the, the bass beat, and so they're all kind of in time and in tune. But it's a magic thing, because it, transports you out of yourself. Transports you out of, often the songs are familiar, but they're transporting you into some other culture where there's a choral group standing on a beach in, in Somalia and they've got, and they're, and they're singing. And they're doing something with their feet while they're singing. And it's all in time with the, the street musician in New Orleans. Oh, yeah. And, and, the, and, and, you know, learning learning that there's the world is more various, richer, and more true to itself than we can allow. That we 
we're all constantly imposing from outside, you know, constantly bashing things we don't understand. And this, I mean, when I, when I say multicultural, it's become a, a high compliment that, that Phoebe and Kathleen and, and the rest and Phil have educated me. You remind me of Ursula Le Guin's book, The Lay of the Heaven, someone tries to imagine a world without, without prejudice or, or color distinctions. And it's a, this person is an effective dreamer. In other words, what she dreams is true and wakes up and everyone's great. <laughs> and um, it's, it's this amazing book because through every iteration, these two lovers are looking for each other. And they are different colors. And each time the world has changed, every time this person wakes up, the world has changed. So we don't want to lose those differences. We just want to be able to present them in a context where we can, as Paul said, we can play together, we can try to solve the world's problems, we can present beauty to each other, and um, we, we try to keep it changing, keep it moving. It, does, does anyone have questions for us? What was the name of that book again? It's called The Lathe, L-A-T-H-E, oh, okay. The Lathe of Heaven mm -hmm. by Ursula Le Guin. You guys are doing just fine. That's <laughs> because we're fine to add. So, you know, a lot of the students so, 
I've had in many parts of the world, you know, I've taught at small, I haven't taught at the community college, but I've taught at, you know, sort of regional two universities like Oklahoma, well, it was the University of Central Oklahoma. When was that? Um, 10 years ago, 12 years well, ago. that's the trend now. Right, right. It's, it's all the melting now. Yeah, I, I don't know what courses they offer there. I mean, I, ta I went back and gave a reading there about two years ago, but, um, and I didn't really study to compare the course offerings. But I know that mo many of the students in the creative writing classes, I was teaching a composition course, which had mainly 18 and 19 year olds who weren't really sure why they were there, except that they knew they had to get a college education. There you um, go. But that's typical. I mean, yeah, that's true is. when I was 18, 19. Yeah. There were a lot of people, it's not that when I was in the non-honors class, classes, a lot of the people didn't know what, why they were there. A lot of the guys were there so they could stay out of the draft, you know, because I'm of that age, you know. And, um, but now, um, many of the students I teach are people who are, some of them are retired, some are mid-career, many of them have full-time jobs, but they want something other than that very utilitarian kind of work that they're doing or the degree that they got in nursing or or retcom or something, so whatever they can to get some kind of job. Everybody's got to work, you know, but they want but some kind of life. Job. And Richard Hugo who gave his can name. I, can I break in, Carol? Sure, sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, one thing that is still very popular and in fact is being recreated, this notion of teaching writing, what we teach is a narrative, how to tell a story, right. which is absolutely rock bottom to being a human being. How do you tell a story? Doctors are going back to school to learn how to tell a story to their patients. Yes. Uh, all see, there's different different professions, professions, especially. I'm talking about the curriculum. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. yes. Right. But yeah. that's what I'd like to see yeah. is the I curriculum really offered in this form of yes. narrative. How yeah. do you tell a story? Yeah. My son went to the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. He walked out of Aereo, Monica, whatever, and so he walked, he had enough brains when he went down there to walk home with the art department. He graduated in art, and now he is hired, and they tell him almost every time. We hire you at this startup. You self-taught all your flash and all the coding and all that, but because you have an art degree, mm -hmm. and that what makes you different from everybody else. Right. So it's not doing art for them, but at least they realize that there is some kind of perspective. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So tell us the story. And Richard, I <laughs> always want to hear those exceptional yeah. stories. Yes. So Richard. Okay. Uh, so, uh, it won't die if it means something important to people, either to the readers or the writers. Right? And my life was saved by Orwell, the English socialist Michael Foote, and William Hazlitt, who were my teachers in literature. Now I can read poetry, I'm fine. But before yeah. that, it was you know, meaningless. So likewise, uh, I would say that you know, young people are really creative. Look at the hip hop scene or the punk rock. Uh, some of what they do is very intense for yeah. me. So I just want to thank yeah. everyone for coming. I want to thank our speakers and everyone from the Raven Chronicles who's able to be here. Check out some of the work that's now being taken down the board. And there are um, issues These to purchase. Are yeah, with a few guidelines. Um, yeah. For our next issue, if anybody's interested, yeah. the deadline has been extended to July 1st, not June 1st. So it's a humor. It's going to be a humor. Yeah. 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 Yeah.